Gabriel checked his watch for the fifth time, shuffling on the uncomfortable bench he had picked. He hated to keep people waiting, and he loathed being kept waiting in return. Nish and Pista he could understand. Children were famous for taking an hour to put their shoes on. Emile and Rosati had less of his sympathy. The only reason he could think they would be held up is that they had taken some time to canoodle. Tapping his foot against the floor, Gabriel checked his messages. Understandably, they were very few of them, not just because he was almost 300 light years from Earth, but because there was no one who would contact him outside of work. The first three were confirmations from Nish, Evola and Rosati that they would definitely be there. I was with messages from the zoo confirming the various tours Gabriel had taken were booked. It was the last one that took the most of his attention. It was from the mayor's office, and at first he had thought it was spam, but if it was just an attempt to get him into a surprise interview or something, whoever had sent it had indeed put the work in. The email requested a meeting between Gabriel and the mayor. It was far more flowery than that, of course, crowned full of corporate speak, but if he was reading it right, they wanted to apologise for what had occurred. Legitimate or not, his first instinct was to delete it. He was still frazzled from the interview, and another official meeting might just suck the life right out of him. Gabriel decided that he would talk to Nish about it, if it were indeed genuine, then Nish would have most likely gotten it as well. There he is, Pista cried, as she galloped towards Gabriel as fast as possible and leapt onto him. Had it been a human child, he might have been injured by Pista's little stunt. Instead, Gabriel grabbed her by the waist and lifted her above his head. Someone needs to be a lot more careful, he said, standing up and holding her as high in the air as he could. Pista armed happily as she did so. She really got to fly outside of the apartment, and she longed to be able to flitter about as she had done back home. Gabriel placed Pista back on the ground, and she let out a noise of disappointment. Sorry we were a little late. Pista wanted to go out naked today, said Nish, approaching Gabriel. No, I did not, retorted Pista, standing on the ground. Then why didn't you get dressed when I told you to? responded Nish, clapping her hands together. Gabriel supposed that was similar to a human shaking their fist, but that was not what took up most of his attention. Speaking of clothes, you put a bit more effort into yours today. Nish had indeed put more thought into her outfit than before. Gabriel could not call what she was wearing a dress exactly, but it was definitely far more elegant and flowing than her other garments. What's more, it was covered in a pattern that matched, though did not mimic, the ones on her wings. The Thunder fidgeted slightly before applying. Is something grown to Thunder do when they go out in groups? I see, replied Gabriel. He wasn't sure if it was true. Her reaction to him mentioning it was strange. But then again, maybe asking about someone's clothes was seen as rude amongst her people. Gabriel supposed he could have asked about it, but he did not want to push her more than she was willing, and to be honest, he did not really care. The fact that Pista did not question her mother about it gave Gabriel the impression that his assumption was correct, as Pista's theory of mind was clearly still developing. I take it Evola and Rosati are not here yet, stated Nish, glancing around the area. The lobby of the learning centre was enormous, easily as big as five football pitches, and vast windows surrounded half the building, allowing the early morning light to shine in. Many interactive displays dotted the area, providing games and educational content for the various visitors. Uh, no, something tells me Evola is not one for keeping appointments. I have no idea how she can be a successful psychologist, replied Gabriel, shaking his head. Upon seeing how it moved, Pista grabbed his skull with four arms, and began rotating it in place, chirping to herself as she did. I would guess it's because all her patients come to her, said Nish, looking up at the ceiling. A vast skeletal replica of some enormous ocean creature, the size of the largest whale, hung above them. Gabriel chuckled. That was most likely it, and followed her gaze. It was an impressive beast. He wondered if there were any swimming in Minigrad's oceans. There were numerous ocean tours, both surface and submersible. Gabriel would have to check when he got back to the penthouse. Minutes ticked by, and Gabriel's patience began to wear thin, not just because of the time he was wasting, but also the looks he was getting. Ola's deduction had been correct, but once he had passed through the city unnoticed, now everyone recognised him or rather his suit. Almost an hour after they agreed to meet, Evola and Rosotti finally arrived. As the two approached, Evola's arm wrapped around Rosotti's shoulder. Gabriel got to his feet. Forty. What? asked Evola, looking at Gabriel through her mask. We agreed to meet at forty, and it is now forty-one, he said, his voice flat, and he's feeling impossible to ascertain. I told you he'd be upset, said Rosotti, trying her best to hide behind her girlfriend who was smaller than her. We're already running late, let's get going, said Gabriel, turning on his heels and walking towards the front desk. 
Erelo was feeling a mix of annoyance and respect. Giru had made her feel like she was a naughty little girl being scolded by her father in under 10 seconds. There was no charge to enter the learning centre, but you needed to press a button so administration could track how many people visited the place. The five of them did as the sign kindly asked, and they were free to explore. There was a linear path set up through the building, and seeing as their tour would not start for a few more hours, they were left to their own devices. Entering a large antechamber with several other visitors, Gabriel and the rest stood at the back, and an employee instructed them to wait. Slowly the room went dark, and Pista took hold of Nish's and Gabriel's hands. A screen then came to life and displayed images of the planet, mostly of nature, but there were also pictures of the settlements and photos of the sky and stars. As the images and video continued to play, a calm, commanding voice was added. You are about to experience the history of Minigrad, from its beginnings as an idea in one man's head, to the first tentative steps seeding a world with life, to the diverse and beautiful world you see today. Please take your time to explore the centre, and we hope you enjoy your day. Adventure awaits, the voice explained. One of the walls was revealed to be a door. As the door panel attracted, they exposed a room that made the antechamber look puny by comparison. A vast lattice of floors ran up to the very top of the building, crowned with a domed glass ceiling. Gabriel knew there was far more to the building than he could use. Each floor contained a vast complex of activities for just about every sapient race in the galaxy. Over there, Pista said, pointing at a model of Minigrad, the size of a small car that was almost unrecognisable. It was just a world of bare rock and barren oceans. A ring of what Gabriel supposed was graphene surrounded the figure, and on it was a large green button. Pista pressed it. The same voice from before said, This is Minigarad, 2,000 years ago, back when it was first discovered and called S32434, SW6. Back then, the world that would one day be called Minigarad was a sterile ball orbiting Ilhru, the gas giant above your heads right now, they added. The process of turning the planet into a world with a breathable atmosphere took over 1,000 years and involved the seeding of billions of genetically engineered photosynthetic bacteria. As the atmosphere slowly filled with oxygen, more life was added to the moon until a simple but stable biosphere was established, the voice stated. It was at this moment the history of Minigarad could have gone down two paths. Along one road, it was made into another colony of the Corsaril, but Iwulu Nox's text had another idea. Though extinction rates are normal on worlds home to space-faring people, what if some unavoidable event were to occur? You would need a world that kept examples of hundreds of thousands of different species to repopulate the world. So he approached his government with the proposal, and after years of grueling campaigning, he got the green light, the voice explained. At that point, Gabriel noticed that the ring around the display was covered in written information, providing more specifics about the whole ordeal. Iwalu Noctis had argued quite convincingly that Minigarad would need to be fully independent if it were to serve its intended function, unburdened by political allegiance. So it had been granted the status as an unaligned world, on the condition that the populace maintains the populations of animals it was given, and, in the event of catastrophe, be returned to their home worlds free of charge. In 7596, a planetary constitution was written up, and Minigrad was officially born. Pista quickly lost interest when she realised that the voice was not returning, so she immediately wandered to the next display. This one was an interactive game that said in bright yellow letters, Can you turn Minigrad into a life-bearing world? Pista spent several minutes adding random elements to the planet and failing each time. It seemed she had not paid much attention to the previous exhibit. As Pista asked her mother for help, Erila asked, Are you mad at me? Gabriel looked at her and then turned back to watch Nish do all the half of Pista. No, though I am a little annoyed that you made me wait, he explained. It wasn't that long, Erola pointed out. Gabriel nodded. He did concede that, in the grand scheme of things, it was not an overwhelming amount of time. Even so, Gabriel pointed out, it was still rude of you. You could have called and said, hey, Gabriel, we're going to be running a little late, so we'll meet you an hour later. Erola ground her teeth. We had come to learn that it was the Ponoclid's equivalent of a resigned sigh. I'm sorry, it was my idea. Yes, I thought it was. Apology accepted, replied Gabriel, glancing at Rosati who was also helping populate the digital Minigrad with life. With that spectre dispelled, their day continued, and Gabriel actually found himself enjoying their company. He never disliked any of them, but he had always found he preferred doing things independently. Enjoyable or not, they were still exhausting, and when their guided tour started, he found himself relishing the distraction their guide provided. 
They were explaining the strange biology of an animal that looked like one of those metal wire puzzles brought to life. That was the impossible life he got in a class 2 H. Gabriel did find it interesting, but his attention was drawn elsewhere to a large tank partially filled with water. Approaching the tank, his suspicions were confirmed. Floating on the surface was a large mass of gelatinous material. What is this? Why the hell is a dreamer locked in this thing like an animal? Gabriel asked, raising his voice. Anger bubbling to the surface.